All right. With all that in mind, let's uh, let's look at a few verses to get started, and um, go to Proverbs eleven. We're going to look at three or four verses here, and um, and then we're going to jump into what we're doing tonight. Real familiar verse, Proverbs 11, verse 30. The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he that winneth souls is wise. And, you know, uh, no doubt you've heard that verse, you've, you've read it, but it would seem that um, there's two key words in that verse, and one of them is the word winneth, winneth. Um, you know, we're trying to win people. We're trying to win people over. Uh, we're we're trying to uh, convince them, and um, and we need to win them. Okay, and the Bible says, "He that winneth souls is wise." Look at James three, James three. And so, really, what we want to do tonight is just uh, give you some things that may help with um, a wise approach to people, and some of the things you're gonna you're gonna encounter. James 3, verse 17. It says, but the wisdom that is from above, and that's the kind of wisdom you're going to need to, to win somebody to the Lord. It's going to have to be the Lord's wisdom. The wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, easy to be entreated, full of mercy, and good fruits without partiality and without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. That's the wisdom that's from above. Look at Mark chapter one, Mark chapter one. Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1, verse 17. And Jesus said unto them, Come ye after me, and I will make you to become fishers of men. You know, people say, well, how, how do I know if I'm really a follower of Jesus? And somebody thinks, of, you know, being a follower of the Lord is, well, well, I go to church and, you know, I believe some of the right things and I read my Bible once in a while. So I'm a follower of Jesus. Well, maybe you got started, but the Bible says one of the hallmarks of a follower of Jesus Christ. Jesus said, if you come after me, he said, I'm going to make you into something. He said, if you're coming in the same direction I'm going, he said, I'm going to make you to become a fisher of men. And, um, you know, fishing is something that, you know, you don't usually catch a fish by accident. I guess anything's possible. You could you could be standing on the side of the shore and a fish could jump out and land in your arms. And uh, there are fish that do jump out of the water. That does happen. On a, but that is not the norm. And, um, you know, the Lord wants you to catch more than one fish in your lifetime. And, you know, to 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 be to catch men from henceforth, the Lord said, thou shalt catch men. He said to his disciples, but if you're going to do that. Something you gotta, you know, you're you're fishing. I mean, you're doing it on purpose. Um, Ecclesiastes 12, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes. Now, you don't you don't catch a fish every time you throw a line out of the boat. Um, there are days, some of you, how many of you have, have fished? 
you know, a few times in your lifetime. Could I see your hands? All right. Now, if you just went fishing once, that's really a poor gauge of fishing. Um, you can go out and you can you can throw your hook out there and snag it on the rocks and snag it in the grass and and you know and 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 you can be out there for hours and never catch a thing. And you can go out again and fish for hours and never catch a thing. But boy, you'll go out one day and you'll throw that line out there and bang, something hits that line. You know, and, and you know, you've got your bait, you know, or you've got your you've got your little lure. And uh, in Northern Ontario, we were allowed to use live minnows. And um, I'll never forget the first time that a guy took me out. We, we took us out across Lake St. Joseph. Lake St. Joseph is massive, and it's in Northern Ontario. You can't fish there unless you're a resident. And you have to live there seven months to be considered a resident. Well, that day finally came, and um, three guys said, uh, Brother Joe said, uh, you want to go fishing with us? And I said, sure. So we got in a boat, and we zoomed across that lake for an hour flying across that lake and all of a sudden they said we're here i never did quite figure out how you know where you are but they said we're here and man we were there i went fishing as a kid and it was the most painfully boring thing on earth <laughs> you would you would throw this line out in the water with a couple sinkers and a couple worms on it and you would wait all day long and i as an old I never could understand what the older folks got out of it, but I, I think I figured it out. You know, you know, they, they just like the relaxation. You know, it's like whether they catch anything or not, it's not a big deal. They're just going to sit out there in the sun, no phone, no neighbors, no dog. You know, it's quiet. And they're, whether they catch anything or not is immaterial. But I just thought as a kid that was absolutely torturous. And, uh, and I thought that's what fishing was. I caught one or two fish through the years doing that, but not many. Man, we got out on Lake St. Joe, and we put a minnow on the hook, and we threw it out. And I mean, bang! And, and you're reeling it in, and you've got, a, you've got a walleye on your line, and the water is clear. And right behind the walleye is a jackfish this long, and he's wanting to eat the, eat the, the pickerel you got on your line. And, and I mean, you throw it, you throw it on your thing, you throw it out, Bang! And I mean, for the next two hours, they were hitting like mad. And we kept, you know, you got a limit. You're only allowed to have so many. So we kept fishing so that we could replace our little ones with bigger ones. Whoa, I thought this is fishing. Now, you know what? Even up north, not every day is like that. Not every day is like that. But the point is, you never know. You, you might not have caught anything yesterday. But the Lord said, follow me and I will make you to become. He said, I'll, I'll teach you how to fish. He said, I'll teach you how to do it. There is a wisdom that's part of that. Ecclesiastes 12. Ecclesiastes 12. I marvel at the words we're about to read. I think of these words often. Ecclesiastes 12, verse 8. Vanity of vanity, saith the preacher, all is vanity. And moreover... Because the preacher was wise, he still taught the people knowledge. Yea, <clears throat> he gave good heed and sought out and set in order many proverbs. The preacher sought to find out acceptable words. And that which was written was upright, even words of truth. The words of the wise are as goads and as nails fastened by the masters of assemblies, which are given from one shepherd. You know, there's a sense in which every Christian is supposed to preach the gospel, go into all the world and preach the gospel. And verse 10 says, the preacher tries to find out acceptable words. You know, it's not, it, you know, anybody can get up and tell the truth and you can, you can tell your neighbor, you know, listen, dude, you know, uh, you're not saved. You go to that stupid church you go to, they don't preach the gospel you know, a bunch of hypocrites go there and you're going to die and go to hell and you're going to you're going to sizzle like a French fry forever. And you could are, are, is that acceptable words? Not. But I know guys that do that stuff. I know guys that do that. stuff. Oh, they, they don't. They're not quite as humorous as that. But they just say, you know, if you don't get saved, you're going to go to hell. You're going to burn. Well, that's true. That's true. But it says the preacher sought to find out acceptable words. You know why? Because this is about winning 
people. You can be abrasive. You can be harsh. You can have as well. Oh, you know, it's the truth. And I'm just going to tell them the truth. Yeah, but you're not too smart. Because the preacher sought to find out acceptable words. God said, uh, you know, let, let me let me give you let me give you some bait that will it'll catch that fish's eye. It'll draw him in. Acceptable words. So I want to give you some tools tonight. And I got this from somebody else, of course. But I want you to write this down. Four deadly questions. Four deadly questions. And they are indeed deadly questions. Oh, there's a wisdom to, to dealing with people. And I have marveled. I've watched guys on the street that really, really knew what they were doing. Now, you know, you got to start somewhere. And you, you, you just, it's little by little. And you, you, you're not going to remember it all first time around. But it's like anything else. The more you do it, the better you get at it. You know, a lot of you guys, you're tradesmen. You know, uh, we got contractors in here. We got guys that do stuff. Um, you know, you know, you're a whole lot better at it today than you were 15 years ago. And you know why? Boy, you just kept doing it, doing it. Now you could do it blindfolded. And, um, you know, it just, you learn, you learn. Bob was telling me, we were talking about, Bob is a, Bob's a taper. And Bob's really good at it. And um, those guys, they, they make it look easy. They make it look easy. And it really looks easy until you try it. And then it's a nightmare. And uh, Bob told me, he's back there fixing those two holes. There were two big holes back in that room in there. And Bob told me, he said, he said, you know, he said, I've been doing this for years. But he said, but you never stop learning. You never stop learning. Four deadly questions. So here you are, and you're talking to this, this man, this woman, this teenager on the street. And um, and you're you're trying to engage them about the Lord. And, and then they come off with some statement, some religious statement. So here you go. So here's the first question. What do you mean by that? That is a very important question. What do you mean by that? You know, some people, they'll tell you, oh, oh I, I know the Lord, I'm saved. And, and yet you're standing there looking at him and you're talking to him and you've got a sneaking feeling you are not on the same page. And you know how to, you know how to, you don't say, dude, I think you're crazy. You're lying to me. No, no, no. There's a better way. Look at him and say, what do you mean by that? Oh, I've, I've been baptized with the Holy Ghost. You know, as they're, as they're got their marijuana joint in their hand. I've been baptized with the Holy Ghost. You say, preacher, that's ridiculous. No, it's not ridiculous. One of the last times I was on White Ave. I'm talking to a guy about the Lord, and here comes a dude down the street, and he's selling $5 bags of marijuana, and he's got a whole bunch of them, and he's, he's, he said, man, I'm in a hurry. I got, I got a whole bunch of these. And it, he's, you know, I mean, it's legal, you know, so he's, he's got it. And, and, I, and, I, and we're talking about the Lord, and so I said something to him. He goes, oh, man, I read the Bible five hours a day. I'm going, sure you do, sure you do. You know, I've been baptized with the Holy Ghost. You know what you look at him, you say, you say, what do you mean by that? What do you mean by that? Here's the second deadly question. How do you know that to be true? They're going to tell you something. They're going to spout something off to you. And they're going to say it like they're just the smartest people on the planet and they're just confident. A lot of your new agers, man, they've, they've got an answer for you. And so you look at them and you say, how do you know that to be true? Now, we're going to revisit some of these in a minute, okay? By the way, let me let me show you something, okay? We're going we're gonna to hit these other two questions. This is a Bible I carry in my vehicle. And, uh, you know, when I'm, it's, all, it's always there and I've got it. And uh, when I got a few minutes, I'll pop it open, read it, review some scripture I've memorized, and I've got the four deadly questions right here. It was on an index card, and it got pretty wore out, and I didn't want to rewrite it. So I got some clear packing tape, and I laminated it. <laughs> and you know why you know why I do this? I carry it with me. And every once in a while, when I got a few minutes, 
I review it. it. Takes just a couple minutes, and these questions are really simple, but they're they're awesome questions. And I just read over it, go over it. I'll even you know practice saying it. And uh, you, you ought to do this. You know, you ought, you ought to do something like this and carry it with you. Question number three, where did you get your information? Where did you, well, you know, everybody, you know, thinks this and that and you're, you know, and you go, oh yeah, that, are you sure, that's true. Well, where did you get your information? Now, really what you're doing with some of these questions is you're going to get them talking and they're going to, they're going to make themselves feel stupid. Because as they talk, they're going to realize how ridiculous their answers sound. But you need you need to do that. They need to hear themselves. They need to hear their lack of information. And the fourth question is, what if you are wrong? What if you are wrong? Those four questions will greatly help you. And by the way, it'll help you dealing with some Christians too. Because there, there's Christians that believe some really strange things. And, um, you know, sometimes, you know, our, our knee-jerk reaction is we want to we wanna prove them wrong. Well, you know, you may get your chance to do that. But, but, you know, sometimes what's helpful is just ask them some questions. Just ask them some questions. So... Look at question number two. Question number two is how do you know that to be true? Now, here's what you'll hear. Here's what you hear. Somebody else, you'll be talking to them about the Lord and about heaven and hell. And, and, um, and they'll say, you know what? I just feel like when I die, I, I, don't, I don't believe in this heaven and hell stuff. You know, I just... I just believe that when I die, I'm going to be absorbed back into the energy of the universe. Seven out of ten people on the street that are under 30, they're going to tell you that. You're going to hear that over and over and over and over. Seven out of ten. I can't tell you. how I, I've gotten where I just expect that answer. Oh, so you're not going to go to hell, so where are you going to go? Well, I'm going to go back into the universe. Well, um, how do you know that to be true? And here's the next thing you will hear them say. Well, I just feel in my heart that it's true. So what do you do with that? I just, I just feel like in my heart. And they're just looking at you like they just think that's as authoritative as a book of law. I just feel like in my heart that's true. All right. So here, this question, here's another question that you would ask them. Have you ever believed something in your heart that turned out to be wrong. And then you're going to illustrate that for them very easily. These questions, now they may seem uh, like I'm going to give you a lot of stuff tonight and it may seem uh, a little bit much to remember, but really some of these things are just very, some of these questions are just very natural. They just sort of spring out of each other. Okay. Um, Have you ever believed something in your heart that turned out to be wrong? And they're standing there looking at you, you know, and you could say, you know, like your feelings about some person that you thought was wonderful or, and boy, this will hit them below the belt or some relationship that you had with somebody. You just thought they were wonderful, didn't you? Haven't you been wrong? Didn't you believe in your heart that this person was the greatest thing since peanut butter, and you believed it with all your heart. Were you wrong? And of course, you know what they're going to do? They're going to go, yeah, yeah, I was wrong. Look at question number four. Now, I realize as I give you these tonight, I could have printed these off and... um, and I may, but it's better for you to write them down initially because it will it will make more of an impression on your brain to write these down. And at least in the meantime, you do have a copy. The copy that I carry with me is handwritten. And man, that thing has served me well. Um, the question number four is, 
What if you were wrong? What if you were wrong? Now, I don't know. This is a sort of a, a long, a long question. So if you want to write it down, you can, but it's, it sure is a good question. So I'm going to read it quickly to you and then I'll come back slowly. So here's this dude, you know, they, I'm going to, I'm going to go into the, I'm going to go into the universe. Okay. So is it possible that a person could believe something is on the other side after death? But when he dies, what he thought was going to be there is actually not there. Is that possible? And you know what they're going to do? They're going to look at you. And every time they're going to say, yeah, yeah, you have just shattered floating into the universe. So let me read you that question again. Is it possible? That a person could believe something. Now, if I'm going too fast, wave at me. That a person could believe something to be on the other side. After death. But when he dies... He finds that what he thought he finds that what he thought was going to be there is not actually there. Now, I've got a lot of verses and I'm, and I'm not going to, uh, I'm not for sake of time, I'm not going to turn there tonight. But you know what you're doing as you're doing this with people? Repeatedly in the book of Acts, it says, Paul reasoned with them. Because, look, people, sure, you can, you can flash a bunch of verses at them and you can... You can tell them, dude, this is the way it is. And you know what you are as you walk away? They just figure, oh, you're one of those ignorant Bible thumpers. Because you haven't dealt with any of their questions. You haven't, you haven't answered any of their objections. You know, all you've done is just spout off because you're confident in what you believe. But Paul reasoned with them. So they think that, you know, they're going to be okay when they die. And... Um, and man, I have watched this. I have watched this play out. And man, you get you get running down this rail with somebody, and a lot of times they're just after a minute or two, they're just they're thinking. You know what happens? Normally, they don't ever think. They just swallow what they've been told. All right. So this this question goes right with the last one. Ready? If someone believes there is nothing when he dies, and there is something then he's 100% wrong. This is not a question, it's a statement. Okay, if someone believes there is nothing when he dies, comma, if someone believes there is nothing when he dies, and there is something, comma, then he is 100% wrong. If someone believes there is nothing when he dies and there is something, then he is 100% wrong. Now, this, this these three statements go together. So I gave you the first one, the long one. I just gave you this one. And so this one is the kicker. This one really goes with it. But you can't have a wrong answer
Now, believe it or not, I'm I'm not going to keep you writing much longer. I just I'm about done with the writing part. But I just you you've got to get this. But you can't have a wrong answer unless there is a what question mark. And of course, the answer to that is you can't have a wrong answer unless there is a what. And the answer is a right answer. Now, see, here's the deal. They have been they have been told and primed. Um, they have been told and primed that, you know, there is no definite right answer to anything. Well, you know, so what you're doing is you're just walking down this trail and even even logic tells you that this is, you know, and you, you guys know this. But they don't. They've been trained to just think the most dumb, crazy, ridiculous thing on the planet. I watched this with a couple on the street not long ago. And um, I was talking to this young couple. They were both, uh, they might have been 21 or 22. It was a guy and his girlfriend. And they were, they were down on White Ave. And, and uh, they were there to have a good time. And so they, they stopped and we chatted for a few minutes. And uh, we got going with this whole conversation. And, um, and, and the, the girl, the girl was, she was, she was the mouth and she was the smart aleck. And so she was, she was going to, you know, let me know. And she, she wasn't being ugly with me, but she was just, you know, going to put me in my place. And, and I said, uh, so if someone believes there's nothing when they die and there is something, you're hundred percent wrong, right? You know, they're, they're, he, the guy is nodding and she's just staring at me. And I said, but you can't have a wrong answer unless there is a what. I didn't say it like that. <laughs> I said it very winsome. I said, I said, I said it with a smile. Learn to learn to do this with a smile on your face. And I said, but you can't have a wrong answer unless there's a what. And she's like, and he goes, a right answer. I said, you got it. I said, you know what that tells you? There is a right answer to this question. This question is about eternal life. So the right answer is an eternally right answer. If there's a wrong answer, there has to be a right answer. And he's nodding. And she is like, she had that look on her face like, man, she wants to get out of there. You know why? Suddenly you've pinned them in a hole. And, and she couldn't escape because... Her own answers had brought her to a dead end. All right. You will hear this um, on the street a lot. Okay. Okay. Um, and, and I say on the street, you'll hear it from maybe your coworkers. Okay. You will hear, well, I believe everyone has their own truth. Or you'll hear, I think everyone's belief is equal. I have my own belief. Now that sounds marvelous. It's marvelously ridiculous, but it sounds marvelous because they've been taught this. So ready? So here's where you get to have a little fun and you can make up your own questions, but I've done this on more than one occasion. They'll say, you know, I just, I just believe everybody's beliefs are equal. And what they're telling you is, you know, you're an idiot and you're, you're trying to pin me into your belief, but everybody's belief is fine. And I said, so everybody's belief is okay. And they're like, yes, that's okay. I believe that I am six foot seven, am I? And they're going, <laughs> you could say, I believe that the Atlantic Ocean is right behind this building. Is it? Boy, you can have a lot of fun with those questions. You can just ask the most ridiculous question on the planet. And immediately they see the fallacy of what they have been told. So when they say, I just, I just believe everybody's belief is the same. Okay. You know, I believe I'm standing in Siberia right now. Are we in Siberia? All right. This is a very helpful tool I'm going to show you right now. I'm going to use this tonight and then I'm going to sell it at an art exhibit and make a lot of money. <laughs> But I kid you not, what I'm about to show you is very helpful. I didn't get this from them, but the Word of Life, there's a group out there. They're, I don't know. They, maybe they still exist. 
But many years ago, there was a group called the Word of Life group, and they were very evangelistic. And they would teach their young guys to go out on the street, and they would take a, a little whiteboard, and they would draw the simplest diagrams, and it would draw a little crowd. And, and they would be illustrating truth, Bible truth. And it was captivating, and it really helped people. What I'm about to show you is very helpful. You can draw that. If I can draw that, anybody can draw that. It was supposed to be a circle. Okay? So it's a circle. Okay? So here's the deal. Now, I'm going to explain it, and then I'm going to just illustrate it how you use it on the street. Because you're not going to be carrying cardboard with you. Okay? This circle represents, we'll say, it represents all the knowledge in the universe. Now, here you are, you're talking to some dude, you're talking to some girl, and you're having a decent conversation. You know, they haven't brushed you off yet, and you're, and you're, you're engaging them. And they're questioning you, and you're going back and forth, and, um, and you, you look at them, and you say, all right, if this circle represents all the knowledge in the universe, would this dot maybe represent your knowledge? You're looking at it. Would this be your knowledge? Now, almost every time, here's how they'll answer. They go, oh, not even. See, even they're smart enough to know that the knowledge that they have is very limited. Even if they're brilliant, they know that this, there's no way that they even have that much knowledge of all the knowledge in the universe. And where you go with that is, so it really is possible that the Bible could be right. Maybe. I mean, if this is not even your knowledge, there is a chance that in the beginning God did create the heaven and the earth. There is a chance that what I'm telling you could be true. And you know what they have to do? They have to acknowledge. Now they have to acknowledge that there is a chance that you're telling the truth. You say, what do you do because you're on cardboard? Oh, that's easy. You're standing there on the street. You're, you know, you're in your office, whatever. You can use the wall. You can point to the wall and you can say, if this wall is all the, all the knowledge in the universe and, uh, you know, you can point to the outlet or you can, you can, you know, point to a bump on the wall or you're, you can, you're on the sidewalk. You can point to this, this piece of the sidewalk and there's a crack and you can, you can say, okay, if this piece of sidewalk is all the knowledge in the universe and that little hole right there where that piece of gravel is, is, is that your knowledge? And they'll say, no, not even. It's valuable tool because all of a sudden they have to now acknowledge that they don't know everything. So here's part of what I'm getting at with all of this. We are asking them questions. Yes, our goal and, and, and you'll get to do it. Maybe it's very brief, but you're going to you're going to tell them about the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ how he died for them, how he saved your soul, what he did for you. You're going to have, you're going to have, when you get to the tail end of this, you're, you're going to have 60 seconds. You might have two or three minutes. You might have more. But you know what you're doing? You're asking them questions and you're letting them talk. People love to tell you what they think they know. And as you stand there and listen and ask them questions, they're liking you more by the minute. He that winneth souls is wise. Wisdom. Play by their rules. Ask them questions. And you're letting them talk. The old way of winning people, Lord, when I was a kid, you know, we were all taught, you know, you get the Romans road and the Romans road is a good way to do it. I'm not knocking it. But we were taught, you go up to somebody, you engage them. You divert all their questions. You do all the talking. And then you try to get them to agree and say a prayer at the end. And you know what you've done? You're doing all the talking. No. I might work with somebody. But the Lord says, let me show you how to bait them. I will make you fishers of men. Ask questions. Let them talk. Don't be... Provoked. Don't be provoked. 
you know, people are smart Alex. people are rude and keep a sense of humor. Be, be, what's the word? Be winsome. Keep a sense of humor. Don't let them, you know, don't be rattled. So I want to give you something that you need to remember. Okay, ready? Remember, and you need to remind yourself of this, that the hard-headed are not always a lost cause. You're going to deal with people on the street and some, maybe at your workplace, maybe your neighbor. They're going to be so rude. They're going to be so, so brassy. They're going to be, they're going to cut you off or whatever. And you know what you're going to be tempted to do? You're going to be tempted to think, oh, it's, they're a lost cause, you know, oh, but they're not. Um, in Matthew 21, the Lord gave the parable of the two guys and, um, the master said to one of his sons, go into the vineyard. And he said, I go not. He was the rebel, but it said, but afterwards, Afterwards, he repented and went. You know, you're going to meet some people that are just going to be so hard and they're going to be so. But but remember, remember the Apostle Paul. In first Timothy one, he says, Timothy, uh, Paul says, before I was converted, Paul said I was a blasphemer. And I was a persecutor and I was injurious, meaning he said I was all about hurting people. Um, you know what? Uh, if you had met Paul on the street before the Damascus Road, um, he you would have you would have written him off as one of the most hopeless cases in the universe. But he was not hopeless by it. It just appeared that way. Lord knew how to get his heart. Is not my word like as a fire, saith the word, Lord, and like a hammer that breaketh the rock in pieces. Look at James 5. We're just about done. James 5. Now, if you didn't, if you didn't get some of this and you, you want to see me after and fill in some blanks or whatever, that's fine. James chapter 5. Oh, oh, let me uh on this thing of asking questions. Wisdom. He that winneth souls is wise. You're trying to engage them. Paul reasoned with them. Let's say you're you're sitting there with your coworker, and uh, you know, heaven forbid, okay. But let's say there's a a plane crash next week, and and you know the thing goes down, and um, it's in the newspaper, and and um, your coworker says, "Man, isn't that awful about that plane that went down? This and that and the other." Ask him a question. Say, say, oh yeah, man, that is terrible. I say, I've thought about that stuff. Where do where do you think what do you think happened to those people? Like five minutes after they were dead, what do you think was going on? And they're gonna go, well, what do you mean? Well, where where did they go? What happened? You asked them. And sometimes you have just started a conversation. We were downtown on White Ave with the guys on Saturday, and this was this was a few years ago. And um, somebody was preaching on the street. I don't know if it was Kimya or George or Dale. I don't know who it was. And I was catty corner across the street. Now, one of the things that happens is when you're when they're street preaching is it's hard to pass out tracks right on that right around that area because everybody's in recoil mode, and and so they if they think you're with the street preachers, they don't want your tracks. So, uh, so usually we wind up going a few blocks down where they can't hear us and we'll do that. But at any rate, the street preacher's going and it was still a chapters then, uh, chapters bookstore. And there's two or three guys and they're, they're listening to the street preacher across the street and you can tell they're sort of, you know, oh yeah, you know, yeah, you know, and you can tell they were just sort of. You know, that guy's an idiot, this and that and the other. And, and I walked up and I, I thought, and I saw my opportunity. The Lord whispered in my ear because I'm not real sharp. And I said, what do you think about those guys? Oh, they were glad to tell me. 
they were just so glad to tell me. And so they're telling me and this and that and the other, you know, and, and, um, and, um, and then I said to them something like this. I don't remember exactly what I said, but I said, you know what? I know this guy sound like they're crazy, but when I was 18 years old, I did what those guys said and it changed my whole world. It was the smartest thing I ever did in my whole life. It seems like they're crazy, but they're really telling you the truth. And they're just looking at me. They weren't expecting that. I got to talk to them. I got to reinforce what was happening. And how did I do it? I just asked a question. What do you think about those guys? Let them talk. James 5, verse 7. Be patient, therefore, brethren. We're talking about the hard-headed, the obstinate, the people that seem like they're way hardened. And Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth. The, the husbandman is the guy that sows the seed. And he waits, he waits, he waits for the precious fruit of the earth. And hath long patience for it until he received the early and latter rain. Be Ye also patient, establish your hearts. For the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. You know what you see in the Bible when you read? Uh, you read and you see Jesus with the woman at the well. You see the demoniac of Gadara. You know, you see um, uh, Paul with this guy or that guy. And you see people being converted. And in the scripture, when you see a successful encounter with someone, what we are usually seeing is the folks that were ready to be saved. I mean, the Lord's talking to the woman at the well, and um, like it's it's an amazing encounter. It's brief, and man, she has turned to the Lord. We do not often see what happened beforehand. Um, you know, in Luke chapter 10, it says our Lord sent people out two by two, whither he himself would come. Um, Jesus was going to preach in certain places, but you know what he did? He, uh, he sent these guys ahead of him. You know what they were doing? They were going to prepare the way. They were going to sow the seed. Uh, they were going to lay the groundwork, and then Jesus himself was going to pass by. Um, and sometimes that's what you and me are doing, and especially if it's um, somebody that's hard-headed and they're a smart aleck, and um, they're going to call you names, and they're going to cuss at you, and um, and you're going to think you're going to think, well, that was a waste of time. Oh, no, no, no. Oh, no, no, it wasn't. You're preparing the way. Uh, maybe a week or two from now, the Lord himself is going to pass by their way. And you know what you did? You laid the groundwork. So I want to close with Ecclesiastes 11 and we're done. Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes. We were talking about the bread of life on Sunday morning. Ecclesiastes 11, verse 1. Cast thy bread upon the waters. In other words, you it's like, you know, people take a bottle, you know, and they, they'll put a note in it, put a cap on it, and throw it out on the water and never know where it's going to wind up. Cast thy bread upon the waters, for thou shalt find it after many days. Look at verse 6. In the morning sow thy seed, and in the evening withhold not thine hand. For thou knowest not whether shall prosper, either this or that, or whether they both shall be alike good. Lord said, you just sow, sow when it looks daylight and like good time, sow in the evening. Lord said, you just keep sowing. He said, because you have no idea which of the seeds that you sow will prosper. All right. Amen. Just want to leave that with you. Let's pray. Lord, help us. Lord, help us to be sweet. Help us to win, men. Help us to find acceptable words. 
But Lord, help us to be bold for thee and not to be so timid and not to be so afraid. Lord, help us to sow the seed. Help us to engage the lost. Lord, use us. Lord, make us, as you said you would, make us to become fishers of men. Lord, help us not to be discouraged when we don't catch a whole lot right off the bat. But Lord, help us to be wise for thee. In Jesus' name. I want to give you a minute just to talk to the Lord with your head bowed. Lord, bless this truth to our heart, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. You're dismissed.